This will be a study on the forbidden practices in Deuteronomy 18. So look at Deuteronomy 18, verses 10 through 12. It says, There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord, and because of these abominations the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. So this time of year, especially, all year long, really, but this time of year especially, you're going to be seeing a lot of this stuff everywhere. You're going to be seeing a lot of this stuff uh, celebrated and things like that. And <clears throat> it's kind of weird, but a lot of it has to do with children. A lot of it is directed towards children. And a lot of it, it seems like adults are trying to get children into these things. And I'll explain that more in a minute. But now I just want to go over each one, these nine forbidden practices. It's also crazy that there's nine of them because you got in Galatians 5 the nine characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit. Here you got like nine things that have to do with the unholy Spirit. But the first one is, maketh his son or daughter to pass through the fire. And what that was, was uh, they were sacrificing their children to false gods for personal gain. You know, they passed their seed through the fire of Molech in places like 2 Kings 23.10 and Jeremiah 32.35, it talks about this. And in Leviticus 18.21, it says, And thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Molech. Molech's a false god. And what they would do is, this giant statue god, they it would be made hot, and they'd put it in the hot hands, the, their child in the hot hands of Moloch, and then toss it into the fire in its belly and sacrifice it to their god. And they would do this for personal gain. Maybe they were told they would get extra years or have some type of prosperity if they did this to appease the wrath of their false god. But how do people do this today? Well, today men worship the god of self. They don't have a statue that they worship, but they worship their self. And for personal gain or to look out for themselves, they may have an abortion. They sacrifice their seed to their self. Many times they abandon their children. They're sacrificing their children for personal gain. They don't want to be tied down to a child, so they abandon it. Many times a fa a parents let the world have their children just so that they'll leave them alone, so that they can do what they want to do. You see, to a lesser extent, you're sacrificing your children to a God, yourself. And... Of course, this is the opposite of the fruit of the Spirit. Because what's the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Well, what is what's is making your son or daughter to pass through fire is a lack of love. It's a lack of goodness, a lack of gentleness, a lack of long-suffering. Not wanting to suffer with your children. Not wanting to love your children. Be good to them. Be gentle to them. But that's making your son or daughter to pass through the fire. Child sacrifice. And there's no doubt about it. That's going on literally in places in the world today, whether it be out in the open or behind closed doors, there are still people, still children being sacrificed to false gods. The next one is divination. And that is telling the future or trying to know the unknowable using sinful arts practicing these sinful arts and using evil spirits. In 1 Samuel 6, 2, it says, And the Philistines called for the priests and the diviners, saying, What shall we do? You know, they're going to these diviners to get this 
knowledge that they need. They said, what shall we do? It's trying to know something that's unknowable. Trying to get information or knowledge outside of God by using people that claim to have magic or some type of connection with the spirit world that can get answers for you. For example, Ezekiel 21, 21, For the king of Babylon stood at the parting of the way at the head of the two ways to use divination. See, there's the word. He made, Here's how he's going to use divination. He made his arrows bright. He consulted with images. He looked in the liver. You see, he's doing these uh, things here, made his arrows bright. And I looked up one way uh, they could have done this, and one way they could have done this is dropping the arrows on the ground, and whichever way the arrow pointed, that's the way they would go. Or, you know, they shoot the arrow. In Second Kings 13, 15 through 19, it shows someone, you know, shooting an arrow and wherever it landed. That's the way that, that's the, how they would make the decision. You know, things like that. And he looked in the liver. That's a strange thing, but pretty much they would cut the animal open, look at the liver and see if it was diseased or a good liver or a bad liver. That would, they would have something that would tell them, well, if it's this way, then you should do this. Or if it's that way, you should do that. <clears throat> If you look it up, there's more than one ways that it says that they actually did this. But no matter how you look at it, they're trying to get knowledge or information to know what to do or to tell the future using these weird practices. Pretty much, you could say, just not going to God for the answer. In 2 Kings, and that verse I was telling you about in 2 Kings 13... This is actually a godly person doing this. 2 Kings thirteen fifteen. It says, And Elijah said unto him, Take bow and arrows. And he took unto him bow and arrows, and said to the king of Israel, Put thine hand upon the bow. And he put his hand upon it. And Elijah put his hands upon the king's hands. And he said, Open the window eastward. And he opened it. Then Elijah said, Shoot. And he shot. And he said, The arrow of the Lord's deliverance, and the arrow of deliverance from Syria, for thou shalt smite the Syrians in Aphek, till thou hast consumed them. And he said, Take the arrows. And he took them. He said unto the king of Israel, Smite upon the ground. And he smote thrice and stayed. And the man of God was wroth with him and said, Thou shouldest have smitten five or six times. Thou hadest, then hadst thou smitten Syria till thou hast consumed it. Whereas now thou shalt smite Syria but thrice. You see how they... <clears throat> They used the bow and arrows there, but it was a godly person doing it. You see, sometimes in the Old Testament, God would use objects like the Urim and Thummim with the priest and things like that to give somebody an answer because, you see, they didn't have a complete Bible back then and God would speak to them that way. But the wicked people like the king of Babylon, they would also use stuff but it wasn't God giving them the answer. It would be unclean spirits talking to them. But you see, how do people do this today? Well, they do it with Ouija boards, tarot cards, palm readers, psychics, crystal balls, etc. And uh, all that stuff is, you know, just divin modern day divination. Using Ouija boards. Trying to get an answer. Tell the future or know the unknowable. You know, as a kid, I would see these commercials about psychics, and it would have a number you could call, and uh, I just, even as a kid, I knew it was just a bunch of phonies, and I would prank call them as a kid, and I'd say, you know, if you were a psychic, how did you know I wasn't 18 years old? Because, you know, it says you got to be 18 years or older to call. You know, most of it's just a bunch of phonies, but I believe there are people out there who are hooked up with the right kind of stuff, well, the wrong kind of stuff, and they are predicting the future. Not like God can, but you see, they're hooked up with enough evil spirits to where, you know, the evil spirits have been around long enough to where they can kind of guess what the future is going to be. 
they don't really know the future, but they've been around long enough to pretty much give you a, an answer, been around long enough to know people's lives to where they can know certain things about people to make it seem like, you know, they they can really give you an answer. And anytime, you know, you make your decisions by turning to something other than the words of God, you know, the wisdom of this world from college professors, from counselors, from friends, from family, and they're giving you the wisdom of the world that's contrary to the scriptures, you know, you're really not doing that much different than the king of Babylon was when he made his arrows bright and looked in the liver. You're going to something outside of the Bible, outside of the word of God, that's even contrary to it to get an answer instead of going to God and the Bible. And it's the opposite of the fruit of the Spirit because it's not showing faith in the words of God. No patience for the Lord to give you an answer and work it out. So that's divination. But what about <clears throat> an observer of times? Well, an observer of times would be, and a lot of these go together, so it's kind of hard to give a just a great definition on each one. But an observer of times is a diviner, somebody who uses divination, a diviner who gets answers and foretells the future, but specifically using present signs in the skies. For example, in Isaiah 47, 13, it says, Thou art wearied in the multitude of thy counsels. Let now the astrologers, the stargazers, the monthly prognosticators stand up and save thee from these things that shall come upon thee. <clears throat> God is basically being sarcastic here, saying they can't help you. He's saying, you know, let them, let them come save you. Let them save thee from these things that shall come upon thee. He's basically saying they can't save you. You know, these astrologers, the astrologers, they predict the future by looking at the stars. They're observer of times prognosticators they're observer of times they they uh tell the future by looking at the moon tell a future event they try to tell a future event by present signs or supposedly now they're supposedly doing these things so prognosticators foretell by means of present signs stargazers they predict or supposedly predict the future by looking at the constellations you know the clusters of fixed stars but in the bible what happens god's men always turn out better than astrologers for example in daniel 1 19 through 20 daniel hananiah mishael and azariah also known as shadrach meshach and abednego were found 10 times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all nebuchadnezzar's realm in Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar wants his dream interpreted by the wise men and the astrologers and the magicians. But what happens? They say in that same chapter, those astrologers, you know what they say? There's not a man upon the earth that can show the king's matter. Therefore, there is no king, lord, nor ruler that asks such things of at any magician or astrologer or Chaldean. And it's a rare thing that the king requireth, and there is none other that can show it before the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. But what happens? Daniel comes in and gives Nebuchadnezzar what he wants to know. God's men always outdo the astrologers. And how do men do this today? They use horoscopes trying to look at the future looking up at the stars. You know, they try to rely on other things outside of the Bible to tell the future. You've got the future written in advance in the scriptures. You don't need to look at the present signs in the skies. And I don't profess to be an expert about, about the horoscopes and astrology and stuff like that. But it's it's all obviously very occult like and wicked. 
The next one is an enchanter in Deuteronomy 18. The next forbidden practice you see is an enchanter. And that's someone who can do wondrous things with the help of devils or magic. For example, the magicians who went against Moses, Janes and Jambres. Once again, and you're going to see once again that God's men come out on top versus the devil's men, the magicians, the enchanters. Why do I call them enchanters? Well, Exodus 7, 11 through 12. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers. Now the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. For they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. So they're magicians, they're enchanters. And their rod that they're using is like their magic wand. You see, the magic wand is the devil's counterfeit for Moses' rod. You know, everything God has, the devil's got a counterfeit for it. And lots of toys today, what do they come with? They come with magic wands and things like that to introduce kids into magic. You see it everywhere. You see it on all the ads. You see it when you go down the toy aisle at Target or Walmart or whatever store it is. It's just the stuff is consistently pushed in the child's face. And that's why I said, you know, pay close attention because each one of these in some form is pushed in the child's face. I mean, you got the first one making your son or daughter pass through the fire. Well, that's a direct attack toward a child. Then you got the magic stuff, the enchantment. There's toys with that in the name, enchantment or enchanted. And that uh, popular movie, Hocus Pocus. I remember watching that as a kid back in the 90s. And what's the thing the witch said? She said, come little children, I'll take thee away into a world of enchantment. They made us watch that movie at school. I probably watched that movie 20 times as a kid. It's just odd. This stuff is thrown in the face of children. But that word enchantment, Ecclesiastes 10, 11, Surely the serpent will bite without enchantment, and a babbler is no better. So, how do men do this today? Well, think about stuff like snake charmers. How do they do that? Using enchantments. Probably even those snake handlers do it. I mean, I don't know how they keep those snakes from biting them so much, but I seen a video of a guy the other day. He was up preaching. He's one of those snake handler guys, and he got a hold of one of them snakes, and it bit him in the neck, and he starts bleeding from the snake bite, and he's getting woozy up there, and they eventually have to just carry him out of the church, and you could see his wife watching, his children watching, it was just a horrible sight. Why somebody would put their family through such nonsense is beyond me. You know, he thinks he's got the gifts of an apostle where he can take up serpents and things like that. <clears throat> but I think that stuff is some way connected with all this. Ecclesiastes 10.11 says, Surely the serpent will bite without enchantment. People, they think they got the <coughs> powers to do all this stuff today. You know, the magicians on TV pretend to do real enchantments. Maybe some of them really are. Most of them, it's just a trick, some way that they're uh, just not really doing it, but it looks like they're doing it. Maybe some of them really are doing it with the help of devils but that's enchantments an enchanter the next one pretty obvious one is the witch those who deal with evil spirits black magic and sorcery you know they use things like potions pills 
spells, vain repetition, prayers to their gods and the devil. You know, witchcraft is associated with rebellion and it's associated with fornication. In Exodus 22, 18, it says, Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. You see, if they found out that you was a witch, you were dead. That's how serious God felt about it. And remember how we talked about how there's nine forbidden practices here. And in Galatians 5, you've got nine things listed with the fruit of the Spirit. So there's a contrast. And also, in Galatians 5, 19 through 20, it says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft. You see how it's listed in the same chapter as the nine things associated with the fruit of the Spirit. And you got witchcraft talked about right before the those nine things. Showing you it's, it's a contrast. It's the opposite. Witchcraft is ungodly. Witchcraft is a work of the flesh. Now since it's a work of the flesh, you can have saved born-again people committing the sin of witchcraft. You know why? Because they still have flesh. And if they struggled with that sin before they were saved, most likely they're going to be tempted with that sin after they're saved. And it isn't just using spell books and things like that. 1 Samuel fifteen twenty three says, For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. You know, rebellion, it's, it's up there with horrible sins like witchcraft. And it's the opposite of the f nine things that you have when you are showing the fruit of the Spirit. You know, what's one of the things you have when you're showing the fruit of the Spirit? Peace. You have peace. No matter what you're going through, you're gonna, you are just have that peace feeling. And if you're saved and you've been living right, you know what I'm talking about. No matter how bad things get, you still got that peace going on. And in 2 Kings 9.22, it says, And it came to pass when Joram saw Jehu... That he said, is it peace, Jehu? And he answered, what peace? So long as the whoredoms of thy mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many. You see that? As long as Jezebel is acting like a hoe and her witchcrafts are so many, there will be no peace. And see, this, uh, this, Witchcraft is not just associated with physical fornication, but spiritual adultery and fornication. And that's why in Revelation 17, Mystery Babylon, the great whore, as it calls her, what is she causing people to do? Fornicate. She's causing them to commit spiritual fornication. It's associated with that scene. It's associated with rebellion. It's uh, associated with the woman being the leader, not being under authority to a man. And where do you see it today? All over everything, especially around Halloween. You see it in things like feminism. That's a rebellious thing. In any place where rebellion is present, you see it. Uh, like I said, that movie, Hocus Pocus, that's a big thing right now because they came out with the second one. And things like Room on the Broom, that children's book or cartoon, whatever that is. Uh, what do the witch stories involve? Eating children, sacrificing children. You know, the, even that old thing, uh, Hansel and Gretel, that book or movie, Pretty sure that witch in that book was eating children. Isn't that weird? What is uh, directed so much towards our kids today? Witchcraft stuff. You go to the young adult section at Target. Look at all that. 
You go to the young adult section at Walmart of the books. Look at all that. You go into Books a Million. Look at the children's books, the young adult books. It's spell books, books with witches, books with witchcraft. I even seen some reviews of uh, these but, uh, ch children's book reviews of little children reviewing these spell books that are supposed to be for children. I think one of them was called The Descendants or something like that. Had a lot of witchcraft in it. I think there's even a Hocus Pocus children's spell book. And it's all just uh, pushing your kids in that direction. And even the, you know, the spell book on that a uh, Hocus Pocus movie. What's it got on it? An all C and I. Right there on the cover. It's opposite of the fruit of the spirit. No peace. No goodness. You know why? There's no such thing as a good witch. So that's a witch. That's an obvious one. The next one is a charmer. A charmer, that's one who subdues or controls with the use of magic casting spells with just words or charms or amulets. And it seems to be about what they say a lot of times. Really emphasizing that. You see, these things go together, but it seems like each one em really emphasizes a, a particular detail or characteristic. And with this one, I think it's uh, the use of charms and also... Things they say with their mouth that can get control of somebody or a situation. In Psalm 58, 5, it says, Which will not hearken to the voice of charmers, charming never so wisely. <coughs> so a charmer seems to be somebody who can really uh, get control over somebody with what they say. And where is this today? Well, when it comes to the charms and amulets, it's someone thinking a certain uh, physical material item has supernatural power to help them out. Like a rabbit's foot or a prayer rock. One time somebody gave me this prayer rock and they said, uh, put it in your pocket. And, you know, that would be okay if, if the, the rock is just to remind you to pray. But if it's to, if it's you touching that rock is, uh, if they're telling you touching the rock is going to give you extra power to the prayer or meaning that rock is going to help you get the prayer answered, then that's like this, that's wrong. And uh, charmers use the power of enchantment. So someone who tells you that repeating certain words will somehow give you power to get something from God or the spirits, that's wrong. You know, the, a lot of the TV preachers do that. They'll tell you, this, you, you just say something over and over, or you just say positive things. If you say positive things, then positive things are going to happen. And uh, Joel Osteen says stuff like that. Joyce Meyer says stuff like that. And it's just watered-down witchcraft, really. It's... Uh, really stupid you know you can say something a million times that doesn't mean it's going to happen um, you can pray about something a million times that doesn't mean God's going to let it happen you know that's not true just because you believe something will happen doesn't not mean that God is as has to let it happen just because you pray something really hard a thousand times doesn't mean that God has to let it happen and you can be extremely positive about it, and it's not going to happen. For example, somebody just said to me the other day uh, that they know that God is going to deliver their uh, cousin who's a homosexual. And um, they, they say they just know. Uh, there's no way you can know that. Uh, you don't have words that can automatically make that happen. You can't just have some magical prayer that you pray to God that's going to automatically make that happen because uh, God is not going to override that person's free will. 
you see. Now, it's good to pray for that person and believe that God will do it. But um, you got to know at the same time that he's not going to override that person's free will. So that it's not 100% that your prayer is going to be answered. God's willing to save them. He wants to save them. But he's not going to override their free will and save them just because you um, prayed the prayer a thousand times, said some certain words. But the false preachers, they'll say, if you repeat a thing over and over again, having faith that it's going to happen, that it will happen. And that's not true. The uh, word faith stuff is wrong. The only positive talk Saying, you know, if, if, you're all, if you're positive, positive things will happen. If you're negative, negative things will happen. That's not true. Um, charmers use positive words, similar to the false teachers and preachers. And manipulation is a lot like this, to a lesser extent. The average manip manipulation even that goes on in like a, a, a marriage relationship you know, you're con you're using your words, controlling someone to get what you want. You know, some people are really good at manipulation and being, you know, very narcissistic. To a lesser extent, that seems like a form of this. But it's the opposite of the fruit of the Spirit. It's, it's no gentleness, it's no goodness, it's no love because... What are they out for? They're only out for themselves. Complete opposite of how that they're supposed to be. The next one is a consulter with familiar spirits. And a consulter with familiar spirits is someone who gets information or advice or answers from an evil spirit. And a familiar spirit is, is a spirit that comes at the call of a person. And... A, f a familiar spirit is going to be familiar with you and people around you. So, uh, like you got a dead relative. Maybe they walked with that relative a good portion of their life. They know a lot of information about them. Maybe they um, walked with you most of your life. They know a lot of information about you. And, you know, just like you have access to information about people by way of the Internet or a library or something, they have even more access to information about people. They're familiar with you. They're familiar with the people around you. And Leviticus 19.31 says, Regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards to be defiled by the mind of the Lord your God. God's not for them that have familiar spirits. And the, the greatest illustration for this is 1 Samuel 28, where Saul, he ain't getting answers from God. He ain't getting answers from, from God by the way of Samuel. He's not getting answers from God by the way of Urim. So now he's going to seek after the witches, the people that got familiar spirits and Things like that. It says in 1 Samuel 28, 3, Now Samuel was dead, and all Israel had lamented him and buried him in Ramah, even in his own city. And Saul had put away those that had familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. So he had put all these people away. You know, maybe you used to deal with witchcraft and stuff. And since you've been saved, you put all that away. But there's something in you that's telling you to get it back out. Go back to that stuff. Go back to the Ouija board and things like that. Never do that. Because the Bible's got all the information you need. It's got all the future telling that you need. But Saul, he wants to go back to that. He wants to uh, find, you know, somebody that has familiar spirit. And he does in First Samuel 28, 8. And Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment. It's kind of like he's going trick-or-treating. And he went and two men with him. And they came to the door by night. Came to the door by night. I don't know if they said trick-or-treat or not. But it says, and he said, I pray thee, divine 
There's that word, remember, divination. You see, all these things go together. This woman is uh, a witch. So you see see all, how all these things they that we've been talking about, they come together. She's a witch. She divines, so she's got divination. She's got a familiar spirit, so she's a consulter with familiar spirits. And she's a rebel because she's doing something that Saul had already said that you can't be doing in this land. And she's doing it. So she's rebellious. She's associated with all these things that we've been talking about. Just about it. And the woman said to him, Behold, thou knowest what Saul hath done, how he hath cut off those that have familiar spirits. Notice that she's been deceived. She doesn't know that this is Saul. And you see um, how the devil works. This woman has been deceiving people for probably her whole life. And the Bible says, Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. She's deceived so much that it's coming back around on her. Now she's being deceived. Saul has deceived her. And she says, Thou knowest what Saul hath done. She's saying this to Saul. She don't know it's Saul because he's in his little Halloween costume. She says how he hath cut off those that have familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. Notice she's associated with wizardry as well. Wherefore then lest thou a snare for my life to cause me to die. Because you know, God plainly said, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. And Saul swore to her by the Lord, saying, as the Lord liveth, there shall no punishment happen to thee for this thing. Then said the woman, Whom shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, Bring me up Samuel. And when the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice. And the woman spake to Saul, saying, Why hast thou deceived me? For thou art Saul. And the king said unto her, Be not afraid, for what sawest thou? And the woman said unto Saul, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. So a lot, there's a lot of controversy about was this actually Samuel that she brought up out of the earth or was it somebody else? Was it an unclean spirit named Samuel impersonating? Was it a familiar spirit named Samuel that's just impersonating Samuel? See, maybe there's just the same way that most likely each one of us would have uh, an, some angels that follow us that the Lord uses to take care of us. Maybe there's also unclean spirits the devil assigns to people that follow them, get information about them, and they're familiar with that person. Maybe that's what's going on here. I've always believed that it was actually Samuel, and this is just a rare case where God actually allowed uh, someone to be uh, brought up from the dead. I don't believe that could happen today. You're, you're dealing with something different here because... Samuel wasn't in heaven, you see. He was in the heart of the earth. That's why he was, it says he was brought up. He didn't come down from heaven. Uh, in the Old Testament, you couldn't go to heaven when you died as a saint because Jesus hadn't died yet. So he is in the heart of the earth. So you have something different. I don't believe today that uh, people are coming back from the dead at all. But I don't believe you can just talk to people that are in heaven or that are in hell like this. I think this was a rare case that it was actually Samuel she was talking to because the, the narrator says it was. It says, and when the woman saw Samuel, it wasn't Saul lying and saying that it was Samuel. It wasn't just the woman saying it was Samuel. The, the Bible itself, the narrator itself says, and when the woman saw Samuel. So, but you see how that how that story really shows how all these things are connected. It's connect this woman, she's a witch, she's a consulter with familiar spirits, she's using divination, she's a rebel, she's deceived. So that's a consulter with familiar spirits. Somebody who gets information, advice, and answers from unclean spirits. And the next one it mentions is, in Deuteronomy 18, it mentions a wizard. And it's hard to distinguish between all these things. You know, what's the difference between a witch and a wizard? But a wizard, 
I've tried to find the best definitions of this I could find. The best one I found for a wizard is someone who practices magic from hidden or secret things that they've learned in books. So it's like, you know, he's got, it's like he's gotten powers just from learning how to have the powers. You know, Harry Potter. I never saw the movies, never read the books as a kid. Thankfully, I was uh, blessed and never having uh, to get into that. You know, I got into a whole lot of other stuff that's probably a lot worse, but I never did get into the Harry Potter stuff. And the books and movies were popular in my entire childhood, teenage years. But I remember, uh, you know, just being a kid during this time, hearing people talk about Harry Potter being in some type of wizard school. And see, that when I read that definition, that makes a lot of sense. It's a wizard is someone who practices magic from things that they've learned. Somebody's taught it to them. And it seems like the other stuff was more is more natural. Like a witch, she's got powers. And obviously she learns stuff from spell books. But it seems like it's more, they're just naturally that way. Where a wizard, he's learned, he's learning it, you see. And wizardry talked against throughout the Bible. And if you stop and think about it, this stuff that we're talking about is m mentioned throughout the Bible. It's not a small topic in the Bible. I'm not just uh, going to Deuteronomy 18 and uh, wanting to be, you know, just because it's Halloween using this topic. It's actually throughout the Bible, these, uh, these things. You see, it says in Leviticus 19.31, Regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards, to be defiled by them. Leviticus 20 and verse 6, And the soul that turneth after such as have familiar spirits and after wizards to go a whoring after them. Notice that word again, whoring. You know, you're the, when you go after these things, you're committing spiritual adult adultery. 1 Samuel 28, 3, back to that story. Saul had driven out the wizards out of the land. In 2 Kings 21, 6, the king Manasseh, the wicked king Manasseh, it says he made his son pass through the fire and observed times, used enchantments, dealt with familiar spirits and wizards. Then look what it says. He wrought much wickedness in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. In 2 Kings 23, 24, mo moreover, the workers with familiar spirits and the wizards and the images and the idols and all the abominations that were spied in the land of Judah and in Jerusalem did Josiah put away. Now, why did he put them away? That he might perform the words of the law which were written in the book that Hilkiah the priest found in the house of the Lord. So wizardry associated with things that make God angry. When Saul was trying to do right, he put them out of the land. When Josiah was trying to do right, he put them out of the land. In Isaiah eight nineteen, it says, And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep. They <coughs> look into things, occult things. They give you an answer. And that mutter, they say things with their mouth uh, like, a, uh, like a charmer. Should not a people seek under their God for the living to the to the dead? You see that? He said, should not a people seek unto their God? Don't seek after the wizards. Don't seek after those that have familiar spirits. You, they can give you an answer. They can look into certain things, their books. Their, they can look in the liver. They can make their arrows bright. But can they give you an answer from God? Isaiah 19, 3, And the spirits of Egypt shall fail in the midst thereof, and I will destroy the counsel thereof, and they shall seek to the idols, and to the charmers, and to them that have familiar spirits, and to the wizards. So a wizard, he's a charmer, most likely. He consults with images, most likely, because he seeks to the idols. And he's 
learned things. You know what this all this stuff they're pushing in kids' faces today with the books, the movies, the TV shows. They're trying to teach them something. They're going to learn something from all this stuff. They're learning about how to do this witchcraft, the wizardry. That's why you got the wizard books. Uh, they got all this stuff. Wizards of Waverly Place, Harry Potter. It's just it's just thrown in your face everywhere. Uh, Merlin. That I remember that movie as a kid. Merlin the Wizard or whatever. And uh, I mean, they even got a basketball team, the Washington Wizards or something like that. I liked it better when it was the Washington Bullets. You know, bullets, I mean, that's not a bad thing. I mean, they think if it's bullets, you're talking about killing people. No, just because you like guns and bullets don't mean you're killing people. That's a lot better than wizards. Um, but yeah, wizards, witches. The next one in Deuteronomy 18 is a necromancer. And that's someone who claims to talk to the dead. Once again... Back in First Samuel 28, that woman is someone who claimed to be able to talk to the dead. But you see, these people that are claiming to be talking to the dead aren't really talking to the dead. Now, most likely that woman was back in First Samuel 28. And when she saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice. That makes you think, well, this is something strange to her that she's not had happen before. Or she wouldn't have been a, a, cried with a loud voice like that. But you see, a necromancer is someone who claims to talk to the dead, not just a, a unclean spirit or a spirit, but someone who claims to talk to the dead. For example, the kid on the Sixth Sense, that movie that came out in the 90s, claims to see dead people and talk to dead people. That would be a necromancer. When people die, you see, they're either in heaven or they're in hell. They're not hanging around here on the earth. It says in 2 Corinthians 5, 8, We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. When you when you die as a saved person, you're absent from the body, you're present with the Lord. You're not coming down here and talking to... As a saved person, even if you did come back, let's just pretend you did come back, do you really think that you're going to go and talk to the psychics and the mediums and these witches, and these people that are doing things contrary to the Bible, if you're going to talk to somebody, you would talk to, if, the, if it was actually possible for a saved person to come back from the dead, why is it that they're talking to the devil's people instead of God's people? You ever thought about that? In Luke sixteen twenty three, when the rich man dies, he lifts up his eyes being in torments. He's not walking around on the earth. But uh, consulting with familiar spirits, they're talking to familiar spirits. They're not talking to the dead. Necromancer, someone who claims to talk to the dead. So that witch of Endor, back that, back there in First Samuel twenty-eight, that Saul went to, she's just connected with all this stuff. She's a witch. She's rebellious. She's deceived. She's a consultant with familiar spirits. She's associated with wizards necromancy <clears throat> and this is not a small topic in the bible as i said i mean just off the top of my head here just just think about it think about in genesis you know what do you have in genesis you got magicians pharaoh sought to the magicians before he sought pharaoh for interpretation think about exodus what does exodus say thou shalt not suffer a witch to live leviticus it, it warns against wizards. It warns against those that have familiar spirits. The book of Numbers. What happens in Numbers? Well, you got Balaam. What's Balaam called? A soothsayer. He, he's a, he uses sorcery. He wants to... Uh, Balak wants him to curse Israel with his demonic powers. Uh, Deuteronomy. You have it mentioned there. Joshua mentions occult stuff in it. Judges, a book where every man is doing what's right in their own eyes. Rebellion, rampant in the book. It's all through the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, 
Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel. Once again, Witch of Endor, that's in First Samuel. You read through those kings, First, Second Samuel, First, Second Kings, First, Second Chronicles. What are those guys doing? They're they're they don't want to go to the prophets. They want to go to the witches. They want to go to those that got familiar spirits. <clears throat> The minor prophets, the the uh, the major prophets, they warn against divination. Jeremiah does, Isaiah does, uh, Ezekiel. The minor prophets, you see them talking against a prophecy against the great whore, Mystery Babylon, the mother of witchcrafts. And then you get into the Gospels, and you see all the demon possessed people. So that goes right along with this stuff. You get in the book of Acts, you got Simon the Sorcerer. Uh, you get uh, into Paul's Gospels. He's warning people against witchcraft. He's warning against people who will bewitch them. And I mean, this is, I didn't even, I just started talking about this off the top of my head. If I had sat down and really looked at each one, uh, you could really have, you could really make a huge list of all this occult stuff mentioned throughout the Bible. You get to Revelation, Mystery Babylon. It's just, it's over and over again throughout the Bible. And the crazy thing about it is, they're after the children. <clears throat> and something interesting, Second Kings 21, you got, King Manasseh. And notice this in Second Kings Second <coughs> Kings twenty one one. Manasseh was twelve years old when he began to reign. That's a young age. And he reigned fifty and five years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Hephzibah, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, after the abominations of the heathen, heathen, whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. For he built up again the high places, which Hezekiah his father had destroyed, and he reared up altars for Baal, and made a grove, as did Ahab king of Israel, and worshipped all the host of heaven, and served them. And he built altars in the house of the Lord of the which the Lord said in Jerusalem will I put my name. And he built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. And he made his son, now look at this, he made his son pass through the fire and observed times and used enchantments and dealt with familiar spirits and wizards. He wrought much wickedness in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. And he set a graven image of the, of the grove that he had made in the house of which the Lord said to David and to Solomon his son in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all tribes of Israel, will I put my name forever. You see, he did all this stuff. All the stuff mentioned in Deuteronomy 18, he was doing it. And more so. And when did he start? Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign. This stuff got into him at a young age. And that's what they're trying to do today. They want to get this stuff into your kid at a young age. Pump them full of it. And of course, they, they may not grow up and be some witch or psychic or wizard. But they're going to be just pumped full of rebellion and things that are against God. And it's almost like you, you just can't get away from it today. Everywhere you look, this stuff is just everywhere. Being thrown in your face. It's like the homosexual stuff. You think about it, the homosexual stuff is connected with this because it's rebellion. The rebellion and fornication involved in homosexuality. Just like witchcraft, it's rebellion and fornication involved in that. But they're after the kids. And you know, that devil-possessed kid and um, uh, devil-possessed young man in Mark chapter 9, you know, the Lord asked him, how long is it ago since this came unto him? You know, the unclean spirit. And, and the boy's father said, of a child, came to him when he was little. You know, the devil likes to come to the weakest link. You know, he approached Eve, the weaker vessel, before he approached Adam. If That's kind of what makes me think, well, maybe they didn't have kids before the fall, because if they had kids before the fall, 
most likely he would have approached the kid. I mean, that's not a foolproof answer there, but that's what makes me lean towards most likely they didn't have kids before the fall. They could have, but, you know, the devil most likely would approach the little kid first, maybe. Or, at the same time, maybe he, the devil knew, you know, the, the man would most likely be more overcome by the wife than the child. But the stuff's after our kids. And something else about Manasseh is, even though he did all this wicked stuff, even sacrificing his own kid to the gods, he still was able to repent and get get the favor of God on him. And that goes to show no matter what you've done, even if you're all into this stuff and you've done it your whole life and you've just been uh, into just every form of just evil and wickedness, you can still be saved. Uh, there's nobody that can't be saved. There's nobody that's just, just so wicked that the blood can't save them. You see, there's a lot of preachers that go around, teachers that go around, and they say, this person's a reprobate, and they've they've crossed God's deadline. They can no longer be saved. That's not true. If you know you're a sinner, you know you're going to hell, and you know that Jesus died on the cross in your place, you can be saved. If you've got that desire to be saved, come to Jesus Christ right now and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He died on the cross for your sins. He was buried and resurrected. And he shed his blood on the cross for you. All you got to do is come to him as a guilty sinner you are and believe on him. The Bible says in Romans ten thirteen, For whosoever, whether it be a witch, a necromancer, a consultant with familiar spirits, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's all you got to do. And no matter how wicked you've been, whether you're a witch or a charmer or a consultant with familiar spirits and a homosexual, might have even killed somebody. You can still be saved, but you don't want to wait too late because you don't know when you're going to breathe your last breath. But this has been a study on the forbidden practices of Deuteronomy 18.